Okay, quick check. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, just to let you know, uh, I caught a cold, so my voice is starting to go, so I may not be able to speak in as much detail as I usually do, okay? Uh, before we go ahead and start this, uh, we're going to come back to the practice questions in a second. I just want to show you some um, kind of like some guidelines for the final exam. So give me one second. Let me load that up, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. So uh, things provided for you for the final exam, I will give you a test booklet that has 70 multiple choice questions in it. <clears throat> you get 110 minutes to take this multiple choice. I'll also provide you with two pieces of scrap paper and an ACS data sheet. Uh, things that you need to bring. So you wanna make sure you bring a more than one pencil, preferably, because uh, you'll be working with Scantron. Uh, water to drink if you need water. Uh, Non-graphing scientific calculator. So if anyone has one of those TI-84 calculators, you cannot bring those. You must get one that's a scientific non-graphing. So it looks kind of like this, okay? And once again, bring your knowledge of chemistry as well. Anyone have any questions before we continue? Okay. So a couple of rules. Uh, do not write in this test booklet. They are very strict with it. If you write in the test booklet, I give you a zero. This is the ACS test booklet that the department is providing, as far as I was told. Uh, according to QD First, I think it's Remsen 101. So if you sign on to CUNY First, you should be able to see the time and the room. I'll also post it in announcements later on so you have it. And if you're not sure where that is, once you come in the front entrance of Remsen Hall, it's to the left side. So come in that main entrance, it's one of the lecture halls on your left side. Uh, once again, don't write in the booklet. If you do, you end up getting a zero and you have to pay money to the chemistry department. It is a big problem. And I've only had two students who did that and it became a huge thing. So let's avoid that situation, okay? Uh, don't look at your neighbors. Obviously, you know, don't try to cheat. They may know less than you do. Uh, I also will have seating arrangements. Uh, you do not need to bring scrap paper. I will have scrap paper for you. So you should not have anything on your table except for what I have provided for you outside of a pencil and a pen and a calculator. So I will provide you with two pieces of scrap paper. If you need more, just raise your hand and I'll, bring, and I'll give you more. The scrap paper is very unique because uh, I have my signature on it and it's something that the department wants to do. So. You can't use any scrap paper that you bring. It'll be scrap paper that I present you with. I also have a very strict rule with cell phones. I'll let you know the details of that on the day of. And please don't bring a lot of stuff. I know it's winter, maybe you want your jacket, but uh, you're going to want to take off a lot of things, put them all to the side. There may not be room for you to put stuff down in. So pack lightly. Okay, with that said, uh, some things for after the exam to keep in mind of in case we don't get a chance to talk about it. Uh, there's the evaluations, make sure you fill those out. And once again, if 90% of this entire class <clears throat> fills it out, uh, everyone gets the plus five points to the attendance and participation. Uh, I recommend getting started with the Alex extra credit. Some of you were able to access it now. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but if you can access it now, you, you're welcome to do so, but I encourage you to do it afterwards because there's nothing to do with the final exam. So no, I want you to spend this time studying for whatever other finals you might have. And once I submit grades, that is it, it is final. I don't change any grades. I never had to change any grades, okay? You do not need to do the final knowledge check. The final knowledge check is to show you what you don't understand and what you need to work on. <clears throat> uh, I do tell you that I always double check, triple check the overall grades multiple times before submitting it, okay? If you want a detailed breakdown of how your grades are calculated, I will be more than happy to send that to you. But usually when I send it to you, it's just numbers. And I'll explain what the numbers are. Uh, I've had students who complained to me and said that, oh, I was too mean about it. It's like, no, I'm just giving you the numbers. So if you're getting 30s, I'm telling you, you got a 30. So you take it as is, okay? Uh, some ending reminders. Uh, so Alex, extra credit gets factored in if, you, again, if you're missing up to maybe like 
100 points worth in your Alex, you get up to 100 points worth added to it. Let's say you've got an 80 on one and you're missing 20 points. You got 90 on the other one, you missed 10 points. And once again, if you already have 100% on your Alex, I will take it under consideration, but it is intended for people who did not do the Alex or is missing some parts of the Alex. Now, I will repeat this part in an email so you understand what I do. I do not like decimals. So I always round up to the nearest whole number. What that means is, example on the screen here, if you get a 78.11, <clears throat> I'm not gonna deal with the 0.11, you have 79, okay? If you get a 69.67, that is a 70. I always round up to the nearest whole number. So no matter what happens, let's say all of your grades were calculated, it's the end of the school year, you end up with a 72.40, okay? I round that up to a 73. That's always gonna become a whole number. So no student can ever say that I almost got this score because no, you actually got a little bit more than what you should have had originally. So I always round up to the nearest whole number, okay? And I do this multiple times. I do this individually for like Alex, um, I don't remember when I, the date is changes every semester. So I'll have to look at it, but it's essentially a few days after everyone finishes their Alex extra credit. That's when I submit things. Yeah, once again, uh, how I do this is I do the round up to a full whole number in individual categories, such as your Alex, such as your final exam, such as your quizzes, right? Then when I total your entire grade again, I do it again. So some of you, if you get lucky, it may actually end up, you may even get one or two more points than you normally would have gotten. I can guarantee you, I never round down. I always round up. Okay, any questions so far? I still recommend it, but do it after you finish your final exam. So every, after everything else is done and you have nothing else left to do, then you do the Alex extra credit. Okay. So we'll continue with this stuff in a bit. I'm gonna go back to sharing the um, questions and we'll go through those questions together. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to point out there are a few more questions that I realized I should have told you to skip because some of them like, for example, you had an equilibrium problem that did not let you skip the quadratic. I mean, we could still solve it, but the whole point of this is to avoid quadratic. So one of them had quadratics on it. Uh, we'll go back over that later on when we go through it. Um, so I'm going to do this in a simple format since everyone has seen this test. Am I right? You all had a chance to look at it? Yeah. Yes. I just have a quick question. When, when you go over it and stuff, are you going to explain like, like why that's the right answer? Well, I would hope so because there's no point of me okay. just telling you that's the answer because at the very end. Like if we told you, oh, we got this answer you're gonna, and you're going to tell us. Oh, well, that I'll do you one better. Mm -hmm. If you look at the very end there is the answer key. Yeah. So I assume you know what the right answer is already. Okay. Yes. It's more about why that is the right answer. So yes. that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Okay. Uh, the format that I'm going to do this just so we save some time and make sure we hit every question. I'm not going to go through each and every single one of these questions. I'll go page by page. So we'll do this first page right here, like questions one to five. <clears throat> and you just simply type in chat which question you want to go over. And then we'll focus on those questions. Does that sound okay? I'll take your silence as a yes. Okay. Uh, so give me another minute to set up one more thing and then we will get started with this. If you haven't taken the quiz, I'm uh, sorry, the, um, taking the practice final yet, uh, you can go ahead, load it up, have it ready and we'll get started. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at the first page. Uh, any questions from one to five? Anything you don't understand? Just four? Okay, so to explain about four, it was actually a question where you do not need to know this one. Okay, I did mention that you're skipping this question, but you could actually kind of still figure out the question even if you had no idea what to do. That's my process of elimination, okay? We see that we have 496 that is between these two numbers. 
So your temperature should be between that range. So there's a relationship between pressure and temperature. <clears throat> With that also said, that means I can cross out anything that's below 104, anything above 111. So I can immediately cross out all of these, okay? Uh, since this number is very close to the 500, I assume the number is close to that. So that's your answer right there. Any questions? And this is just the relationship between uh, vapor pressure and temperature. Originally, the problem is missing something, so you can't solve it. So that's why we decided to skip it. Uh, question number three, highest boiling point. If we look at all of our choices here, right? This is London dispersion forces, London dispersion, London dispersion, and London dispersion. This is the only one that has a polar molecule in there. So this is um, dipole dipole. So this is the answer. OK, anything else from one to five? OK. Uh, anything from six to 11? Okay, someone said number eight. Anything else? 11? Okay. Just those two? <clears throat> okay, so eight to 11. So this is all about your calculations. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have 26% by mass, so you do 20 twix over 100 grams this is referring to by mass okay makes it a lot more easier if you wanted to do this as 260 grams over a thousand that works too because a thousand grams will make it a little easier when it comes to solving for molarity okay so knowing this fact uh the next thing you want to do is you want to go ahead and convert density and volume remember your equation is density is equal to mass over volume okay so I'm going to switch the position of density and volume here. <clears throat> Sorry. So we get 1,000 here, right? This is representing 1,000 grams. The density is 1.115. Oh, sorry, 1.155, okay? And that's grams per milliliters, and that is equal to your volume. This is going to come out to a number that is smaller than 1,000. I believe the number was 865. And that's our milliliters, okay? So let's go with the assumption we use 1,000, right? So I have 260 grams. So I do 260 grams, and I divide that by 98, which is the molar mass of this number right here. And I get 2.65 moles. And remember, my equation for molarity is moles, well, the molarity is equal to moles over liters. So I need to convert this into liters, and I, need to, and I keep this value right here. So let me go ahead and rewrite that up here, 2.65. <clears throat> Change that into liters, so it becomes 0 0.865. When you uh, plug this in, you should end up with your answer right here. Any questions? Now, some of you might have ended up with a different answer. Uh, they, do, they throw these in here to trick you. These two questions right here are to trick you. If you just did that, <clears throat> you don't go any further, that's what people fall into. The other two right here are usually because they flip this. They put it as 1.155 over 1,000. So you would have ended up with 1,155 grams or milliliters instead of that. So most people miss, uh, mess up by mixing this or by simply putting in the moles here. So that's how they get you. Okay. Uh, number nine, <clears throat> uh, pretty straightforward. This is your molarity, and that's moles over liters. Okay. So 1.25 here is equal to your moles, which we don't know yet, over liters. And this is in milliliters, so you have to convert it. So a simple way of doing this, I move this over to the other side, OK? So to find moles, it is equal to my molarity times liters. And in this case, it's 1.25 times 0 0.75. That will give me my moles, but that doesn't mean I'm done yet. Once I get moles, I need to go ahead and convert the molar mass here to find the mass. So remember, moles is equal to. Okay, let me go ahead and clear the screen here. Moles is equal to your mass over molar mass. And remember, we also said that moles itself here was equal to your molarity times liters. So I rewrote all this. Molarity times liters times my molar mass should give me my mass. 
And at that point, it's just this number times 0.75 times whatever the molar mass of CUBR2 is. Any questions? Okay. Uh, no, you have to calculate this. You will be given a data sheet with the reference table, which you'll have the mass of each individual elements, and you would need to figure that out. This is something that, yeah, you'll be given the information where you can find it, but you will not be given the exact number. It won't tell you if the molar mass is this. And this part, finding the molar mass goes back to chem one. How do we change it to grams again? So first, if I had the original equation, molarity is equal to moles over liters, okay? I want to get moles. So I rewrite this equation. Molarity times liters will equal moles. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The next thing I want to do is I also want to look at the other equation. The other equation is to find moles, it is equal to my mass over molar mass. So to find mass by itself, I need to move this to the other side. So then the mass is equal to the moles times molar mass. And since these two are both moles here, I rewrite the equation. The mass is equal to the molar mass times molarity times liters. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. The answer for number nine, um, I believe it was A. <clears throat> you can also scroll down to the very bottom of this PDF that everyone has access to, and it has all the answers. So if you ever missed what the answer was, you can find it. Okay. For the next one here, we're looking for the molality. Very straightforward. This is the same format, moles over kilograms of solvent. Okay. Uh, this is the mass of this. You go ahead and divide it by the molar mass, you get the moles. That's pretty easy. And it tells you that this is in grams, so I simply have to change this to kilograms. So 0.165 kilograms. So this, whatever you get for the moles, divided by this number right here. And I believe the answer was this one right here. Okay? Any questions? All right. Now, freezing point... <coughs> Sorry, for the freezing point, uh, we are looking at water. So right away, should this be negative or positive? This is also where we get to build some test take taking skills. If we're looking at freezing point depression, it should be negative. So I can cross out all of these answers here. And then there's ridiculous answers like this one. Just because you've added some salt into something, you cannot get such a low temperature. That's ridiculous in terms of numbers, okay? So let's go ahead and plug things in. So I have 50 grams. This needs to be divided by the molar mass, and that will give me my moles. Once I have my moles, I can take the moles, divide it by this in kilograms. This is my solvent. So 0 0.085, okay? That will give me my molarity, molality, sorry. <clears throat> Once I get molality, I'm not done yet. Uh, luckily for us, ethylene glycol is just, it has an I factor of one. So Van Hoff factor of one. It will not break into ions, okay? So then the molality times the I, which happens to be one, times your KF value. So whatever this is, times that. And then once you are done, you subtract that number from zero. So zero minus whatever your delta TF is. They put the positives in here to trick you. Because this will be your value for the delta T tf and then most people will just write the answer and they'll just assume that's it but you must subtract zero from that number because it's freezing point depression the temperature must be lower than the freezing point and for water it happens to be zero so you're going to the negatives i believe the answer was this one right here okay any questions okay So go ahead, take a look at the next page, questions 12 to 16. <clears throat> Let me know if there's any questions in here that you want to go over. Okay. Uh, 
12 you've mentioned so far. Anything else on this page? <clears throat> 15 and 16. Uh, so they want to get into clarify. 13, you don't need to know it because I didn't really want you to know Henry's law. So we'll just skip this whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So really quickly, uh, for this one right here, I'm dealing with the boiling point. This is boiling point elevation. So this is going to go increase in temperature. Since we're not dealing with water, you have a KB for this substance, and you have the boiling point for this substance. This is a big hint right here. Should my temperature, my final temperature, be greater than or less than this number? Should be greater than, right? So right away, I can cross this out. I can cross this out even if I didn't do any work yet, okay? Now, everything else is pretty straightforward. I have the mass here, right? So 375, this is divided by the molar mass, which they provide for you. Okay, and that gives you your moles. And this happens to be uh, the solvent. So this is 1.250 kilograms of your solvents. So this is written in grams. So whatever you got for your moles, right, divided by the kilograms, happens to be 1.25, that will give you your molality. With your molality, you then go ahead and multiply it by your Kb. And with this assumption here, since this is carbon and chlorine, this is a covalent bond, these are not ions. So they stay as one piece. They do not dissolve and separate. They don't break into ions, essentially. So then the I is equal to one. Any questions so far? Okay, so your answer should have come out to this value right here. All right, anyone have any other questions for this one? Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at question 15 real quick. Looking at this equation, <clears throat> we're going with the assumption that I cannot tell what the rate law is because what do we say about reaction rates or anything with rate laws? How is the exponent determined experimentally? Do you see an experiment here? We have to do an ice table, right? Uh, no. So an ice table is related to chapter 17 when we're talking about equilibrium. Here, it's not asking about equilibrium at all. It is simply saying you're looking at the overall balance equation and you're oh. looking at the reaction rate. When we talk about reaction rates, it must be shown experimentally, like experiment yeah. one, two, three, concentration and rate. We okay. see none of that. So right away, I cannot say that it has a second order. I cannot say it has a third order. I cannot even write the rate law because I can't see the information. So the only thing I could say is that it cannot be determined from what you've been given. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Okay, on to the very last one here. Uh, what this tells me is that this is third order, right? So the concentration of B. <clears throat> so how will it affect my rate? So the best way I can do this is if I write down my rate here, right? I don't care about A. A is not changing. I don't care about K, uh, K right now either. It's equal to B cubed. So if I double this value, uh, it says double, right? Yeah, double the value. It becomes two to the third power. Tell me what that rate is. What's two to the third power? Eight times as fast, okay? Two to the third power is two times two times two. So you should have ended up with this one right here. Okay, so uh, go ahead, take a minute, take a look at questions 17 and 18 and see if there's one on these that you don't understand. <clears throat> no questions? 18, okay. And 17? Okay, so let me go ahead and switch colors real quick. Um, looking at this one right here, I don't care about the equation. That's not gonna help me. Okay, I do, do, I do know that there's A and B on the left side, and I know I need to find the um, exponents for each one. So I want to find a scenario where only one of these is changing, A or B, and it's affecting my rate. If I look at experiments one and two, right, 
this is being divided in half. This is not changing at all. What is happening here? How is my rate slowing down? By how much? Or by how many factors? Four, right? So if I'm slowing down by half here, this is slowing down by a fourth, okay? So one half to what power is equal to one four? The answer is two, okay? Give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so once again, we determine that this was two. If you wanted to flip the scenario to make it easier, uh, you go from two to one. It essentially doubled to the fourth, and that's also equals a two, okay? So right away, I know that A is going to be two. This is gonna have a two in front. Just with that information, I can cross almost everything out, and I can determine that the answer is B. If you want to continue it, uh, you can go ahead and look at B here. B is essentially doubled here, right? it is staying the same, so experiments one to three. And if we look at this, this is essentially doubled. So it is doubled, doubled. So this is going to be equal to one. Okay, so our answer is going to be B. All right, moving on to the next one. This is pretty straightforward. All we have to do is look at the graph. This is one over X versus time. And the only one that represents one over X versus time <coughs> is a second order, okay? So if I, if I look at this, this is a third order. It's not going to help me. This is something divided by something. It's not relevant. Definitely not this. This is a single order. So it's between these two right here. Now, the good news is, even though there's two reactants here, this is one over X. So X itself is the one that has a second order. Okay? So our answer is going to be C. Any questions? Okay. Uh, go ahead and take a look at questions 19 to 21. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, uh, to explain further about this one, okay? This is one over X versus time. If I have LN of X versus time, right, and it generate a straight line, this will be first order. If it was X versus time and this generated a straight line, then this would be zero order. Just so you have all three pieces, okay? Okay, someone said question number 20, anything else? Okay, question number 20, again, same thing as I just mentioned. These versus time, this is for the first order, zero order, second order. Which one of these gave me a straight line? So our answer is zero order. <clears throat> and that's it. Okay. Uh, slowest step is your rate determining step. That's something you have to know. Okay. So on to the next page, uh, questions 22 to 23, anything here? Okay, I guess all of it. So 22 here. <clears throat> uh, this is our activation energy, okay? I can guarantee you one thing, our activation energy is never negative. Because what do you need your activation energy to be? This is the energy needed to start a reaction, right? It is always going to be positive. So no matter what, you can immediately cross out these three. It is always going to be a positive activation energy. It's never going to be negative. There's always going to be some kind of climb up. With that said, you start with reactants and you end up with products at the end. Products is lower, so you're letting energy out. When you release energy, it is exothermic.
Okay, on to the next one here. Looking at these diagrams, uh, which one is the slowest reaction? <clears throat> uh, if you have no other source of information other than the activation energy that you see, right? Because it only provides you with that information. This middle bar here is the activation energy. So the energy to start this reaction, okay? So I'm gonna write that in terms of speed. C is going to be the fastest because it doesn't require much. It requires 30 joules of energy, kilojoules of energy to begin. A is the next one, it's gonna require 50. And then B is gonna take the longest because it requires 75. So you need more energy just to get started. I'm not even looking at where it ends up, things like that, but just simply to get started. It requires a lot more energy. So the answer is going to be B. Okay. Anything on this page, 24 to 26? Okay, so 24 might have been a tricky one. Uh, each one of these peaks is essentially an elementary step. So four, one, two, three, four. Okay, I guess every question on this page. All right, so out of all these choices, only one of these is correct. So the way I want you to imagine this, right? Whenever we talk about spontaneous versus non-spontaneous, spontaneous usually means if we're looking at a reaction, your reactants change into your products. So we're driving this reaction to the right. And out of our choices here, uh, only this one shows me that it's gonna go from left to right. So reactants are gonna change into products. Okay, any questions? All right. So moving on to the next one. <clears throat> uh, out of all these statements, the only one that is true is this one right here. Whenever Q is greater than K, then we know products change into reactants. When Q is less than K, reactants change into products, okay? And then none of the other answers here make sense. So the conversions are flipped for the wrong way. And then this one also opposite is true. There's more products than the re reactants. Okay. Uh, take a minute, look at this page. Uh, this may take a little more time for me to just go through it in detail. So question 27 to 29. Uh, also, just to clarify, this is the one that you had to use quadratics to solve. <clears throat> so if you didn't get that one, you can skip it, okay? Okay, so I guess both of these. Wait, so we don't need to know 29? Uh, not this particular question, because this one requires quadratics to solve. Okay. All right. So for the very first one, this is my equation. If I compare the two equations, this and this, how are they different? Twice the amount, right? Remember, twice the amount in my coefficient means a change in my ex, uh, exponent. I use a capital A here. Since this is all double the amount, my overall K is squared. So whatever this is, I just simply square it, and that's gonna give you my answer. And it happens to be this one right here. Any questions? And this goes back to manipulating the K value. Okay, for this one, uh, very straightforward, products were reactants. You know it's bromine and chlorine on top. You never have the coefficient here. So this is definitely out of the question. Uh, if you look carefully, you have to make sure this is balanced. Do you see any, um, we're gonna assume that this is balanced just because the numbers are, there are coefficients in front. With that said, do you see a number five anywhere here? Okay, I'll take your silence as you don't know. Uh, there are there is no number five here. You don't see a number five. <clears throat> so you see where it says five here? We can cross that out. That's where to throw it out as well. 
Okay. Remember, it's always product over reactant. So you should have bromine on top and chlorine on top. And it should be over your uh, BRCL down here. Okay. So looking at this, this is not making sense. This doesn't count. It's either this one or this one. And since we have coefficients here, this is squared. BR2 is by itself. CL2 is cubed. So the answer is going to be D. Okay, so we're going to skip 29. Uh, take a minute, look at questions 30 to 32, and I'll be back in one minute. Okay. Uh, once again, any questions from this page right here? I see 30, 31, 32, I guess all of them. <clears throat> okay, so this one's pretty straightforward. You just have to organize it based on what you see here. Um, least completion, the greatest completion. The higher the K value, the more complete it will be. The lower the K value, the less it will be complete. So put this into order, okay? You know that one of these two is going to be the least. So the 1.3 is the least, and then it comes four, right? So it's three and then four. And then over here, we know that two is going to be the most complete. So it's going to be at the end. So this is our answer here. Uh, as for this one right here, we have done the synthesis of ammonia many times. So you should know this equation very well. We'll assume that it is at equilibrium. If I go ahead and increase the container, so there's more space, more volume, okay? The reaction is going to shift to the left. That's going to be the response. The constant will not increase. We know that won't change unless we're changing temperature, right? We're not making more ammonia. We are, however, making more hydrogen and uh, nitrogen using up ammonia. And we can't say there's no effect. That only applies if both sides have the same number of moles. This has four moles. This has two moles. And again, equilibrium constant does not change unless we are changing temperature. So right away, you can cross out A and E without question. Okay, uh, moving on to this one. This requires a little bit of math. I'll show you how to set it up, but I won't do the math for you, okay? Uh, really quickly, you are looking for the equilibrium constant. You are looking for K. And you also know that this is at 25 degrees Celsius, so they're providing you with the temperature as well. They're giving you the equation. It's already balanced because you can see their coefficients there. They're giving you the R, so you know you have to deal with that R equation. So remember this equation is essentially delta G zero is equal to negative R T L N K. Okay. <clears throat> this is the relation between delta G and K. And if you look at our choices here, you're given delta G, you're given H and you're given S. I don't need the S. I don't need the H. If I wanted to, I could, I could do the long way around. I can go ahead and convert this to Kelvin, use the, the delta H and the delta S to find my delta G. But there's no point of doing that. So I'll just take this value right in the middle here. If you notice there's a bunch of numbers, right? You always wanna rewrite this as the sum of your products minus the sum of your reactants. Because remember, delta means change. So here I have four. So four times, it happens to be times in multiplied by zero, okay? And then this is going to be added to CO2's value, and there's only one of these. So it's one times CO2, so negative 394.4. And then this is subtracted from the total amount of my reactants. And since CH4 is by itself, I simply just write that number as is, negative 50.81. And I add this to two times the amount of water, and that's double of this. So two times negative 228. Point six. Once you plug all this together, you end up with your delta G value. We'll say this is delta G at standard state, okay? 
And then at that point, you can plug it into the equation. We know the R, we know the T based on the information that's provided here. And then at that point, you can solve for your K. And you just need to algebraically move everything to the other side and solve for K here. <clears throat> I believe the answer came out to this one right here. Any questions? Okay. Okay, once again, uh, take time to look at the questions 33 to 37. I'll be right back. Okay, any questions on 33 to 37? Okay, I see 34. Anything else? 37, okay. So 34, same exact thing. Good news about this. KP would be more difficult to solve usually, but if you look at our equation, the number of moles is the same. So the change in the moles on both sides is equal to zero. So we can say KP is equal to KC. So if I'm just solving for KC, this is for delta G. So delta G at standard state is equal to negative R T L N K. So same method that we did before. I need to reorganize this. And this is a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio. Uh, it is just simply the products minus reactants. So negative 370. And we add this together with NO, so 86.7. And this is subtracted by SO2 negative 300 plus 51.8, okay? This will give me my delta G value. Once I solve that, I can algebraically move this to the other side, solve for a K. And it came out to the answer that should be this one right here. Okay. All right, I see no one has issues with question number 35, so move over to question 36. Uh, we are looking at the proton donor, so the one that gives protons. If we're referring to protons, we're not talking about Arrhenius and we're not talking about Lewis. We're referring to Bronsted. So it is the Bronsted acid. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the pH of this value right here, HNO3 is a strong acid, so you should know that this should generate 0.056 molarity value or moles of H plus. So at that point, you simply do the negative log of whatever this value is here. Since you don't have to worry about it not fully dissociating, it will completely dissociate, and that will give you your pH value. Even if you didn't solve it, it's not this one right here, because it can't be the same number. It's definitely not these two, because they are both over seven. So just by process of elimination, you're stuck between A and E. And the answer is A. Professor, yeah. so in the exam, we are not allowed to use the graph and calculator. So in order to solve the LNK and log, we need to use the- Take a look at this calculator right here, okay? I know it's a little hard to see. This one lets you do log and natural log as well. It's a scientific one, just as long as you don't have one that you can program. So no TI 83s and no TI 84s. Okay, got it. Okay, Thank so you. these are really cheap. I think they're like, you can get it from $10 to $20. $20 if you go to a more expensive like Walgreens or something. Um, okay. You can find them pretty cheap. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, questions 38 to 41. Okay, anything else? So it seems like everyone is good with acid-base calculations then, for most of you at least. Okay, so for 41, <clears throat> uh, we're looking at the reaction here. You're given your Ka, you're given your, the Ka value of this one as well. So you know the values here. And this one, you also know their Kb values. So we can actually use that information. So let me just make sure I have the right question. Okay. So what I can say, right, is between these two acids, which one is a stronger acid? Based on the Ka values, which one is a stronger acid? HF is a stronger acid, okay? So in terms of reaction here, HF is going to want to give away more of its H than this is one giving away. So it's going to lean towards the left side, okay? So we know HF is a stronger acid. We can write that in there. We can cross out A and we can cross out C. And we, can know, we know that they will not equal each other, okay? So once again, HF is a stronger acid, so we know that fact. So it's stuck between B and D, okay? When it hits equilibrium, the stronger acid is not gonna be the one that's around. It's the one that breaks into pieces. So there should be less HF present. So as a response, there should be more of this present. So concentration wise, there should be more H2CO3 than HF. Okay. Uh, with that said, I see someone said they wanted to go through questions 38, oh, 38 and 40. <clears throat> so, it's really easy when they provide you with a pH because remember pH, right? Or the negative of the pH, 10 to the negative pH is equal to your H plus. So if this is 1.86, 10 to the negative 1.86 is equal to your concentration. Now, when you enter into that calculator, they're gonna give you a easier number to read instead of 1.86, all right? Uh, with that also said, you know that Ka is equal to your H, your A and your HA. And they provide you with the initial concentration. So that goes right there. Okay. You converted this into H plus. So you know you have that answer right there. This is simply just 10 to the negative 1.86. And since this is usually the same value because they split evenly, <clears throat> this value is written here. So let me rewrite that. Ka is equal to 10 to the negative 1.86. And since we have two of them, since this is for H and this is for A, 10 to the negative 1.86. And it is over 0 0.15. Now, with that said, you plug everything in. Uh, I believe the answer was D. Okay. Uh, just so you know, there's two of these OHs. So when you do this, you need to account for two OHs. And the answer was obviously B because you need to account for both of them. <clears throat> if I look at this solution right here, NaF, right, and water, uh, sodium, where does sodium come from? This is the cation of what? What is usually attached with sodium? OH. OH, right, this is the con... Uh, cation of a strong base. But this itself is not going to react with anything. It's not, it doesn't want to join with anything. Fluorine, however, is the anion of a weak acid. So it normally looks like HF. Now, HF doesn't really want to split apart. It wants to stay as together. So F minus needs to try to get back to being HF. This is its goal. How is it going to do that? It's going to take an H from the water. So that's what's going to happen. It's going to more make HF by taking the H. If it takes away an H, this becomes OH minus. Not all of it, but some of it. So the solution is basic. This goes back to your salts. 
All right. Uh, take some time. Look at questions 42 to 44. Okay, so far I just see 44. <clears throat> and 42, okay. So 42, I am looking at a Lewis acid, okay? Remember, when we're looking at Lewis acids, now we're looking at electron pairs. So electron pair for an acid, it is electron pair acceptor. So it's a proton donor, but electron pair acceptor. So out of all these choices here, <clears throat> Uh, which one of these can still receive an electron pair? And the answer is actually going to be this one right here. Okay. It definitely cannot be anything that is negative because they cannot receive any more electron pairs. All right, any questions? And we don't know what the solvent is. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, so we are looking at question number 43. Uh, when we add this to a solution of this, okay? So we're adding the solution. In. This is my equation. Sodium formate, that's essentially this piece right here. I don't care about the sodium, the Na, that doesn't matter to me. Formate is this piece right here. If this is at equilibrium and I add more formate in, how does the reaction respond? Thinking back to Le Chatelier's principle. If you add to the right side, how does it want to respond? Shift to the left by using up that side. So the answer is C, shift to the left. Okay, for the last one here, you're looking for the pH of a buffer. What is a very wonderful equation that you can use? <laughs> For all things buffer related. Yes, henderson hasselbalch equation. I like how you two timed that. <clears throat> so, this is my weak acid, right? This is essentially, I can cross out the Na because I don't care about the Na, all right? Uh, this is my conjugate base. And I have the two moles. And we assume that they're divided by this, the one liter, so it just gives me concentration. So I have my pH is equal to this value. I just have to change that into pKa, so negative log of that, plus the log of my base, which is the 0 0.80 over 0 0.20. And since this is essentially the same as if I just wrote log of four, I can plug that in. pKa plus log of four gives me my answer. Now, if you wanted to just simply do pKa, if you take the negative log of this value, it's something close to four, okay? So out of my choices, I can cross that out. Uh, I can probably cross this one out. It's a little bit too far away. These are all close to four. So it's, kind of, it's up to us to figure out which one. When you plug it in because of the ratio here for the log, you get 4.3. Okay, any questions? All right, let's take a look at the next page. <clears throat> Anything from questions 45 to 47? Okay, guess not. Okay, 46. So looking at what I have here, H3PO4, okay? H2PO4 and HPO4. I want to make a buffer. So I, if I call this my weak acid, right? This is the conjugate base to that weak acid. If I call this my weak acid, this is the conjugate base to this weak acid. Okay. 
So looking at my choices here, they put the NA here to kind of fill in the space. So which one of these will actually go ahead and make a buffer? It would actually be the first one right here. This is my conjugate base, right? This is the same thing that I had written here. And this right here is actually, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. This is my weak acid and this is my conjugate base. So if it's perfectly between these two right here, if I look at everything else, it's either the first one and the third one or something that makes no sense at all because you have PO4, three minus, which is just too far away. That can only be related to this one right here. So that's also out of the question. Um, this one is also incorrect, doesn't seem to make any sense. And uh, oh, you know, so my mistake. This one actually would also work, right? This one definitely would not work. And these can be crossed out. These two possibilities will work. The only thing is I need to figure out which one of these is going to act as my acid. Remember, our buffer has to be close to a pKa value of 8.8. .8. So it's going to be close to it, maybe between 7.8 to 9.8. So that also means that it should be 10 to the negative something along the lines of 8. Looking at a choice here, this is 10 to the negative 3. So the answer should be close to this value here. Okay, any questions? All right. Uh, moving on to the very last one here. Uh, it's also very, very straightforward. This one is just determining whether a precipitate will form. You have PBCL2, okay? So you have the KSP value here. It's given to you as this. <clears throat> uh, if you multiply these two, you get the moles of PB. I don't care about the NO3. No one cares about that. I don't care about the NA. This is how many moles of each of these things that I get, okay? 400 milliliters must be converted into 0 0.4 liters. So you can find the moles of each, then you can take the two moles, so the moles of PB times the moles of CL. And that should give you something that, um, if I can remember off the top of my head, uh, it should give you a Q that is less than KSP. So the answer was B. Also by process of elimination, if Q is greater than KSP, then it will form precipitate. So when so out of our choices here, uh, this is immediately out of the question because it doesn't make sense. So you have these three choices. And if it's no, it's less than, if it's yes, it's greater than. Um, most cases, you will not see where Q is equal to KSP directly. They usually give you a greater than or less than, a very obvious sign. Okay? Okay. Uh, take a look at questions 48 to 52, and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so looking at question 48, it tells you the solubility of this thing is here, but this is for manganese carbonate. Manganese carbonate, right, is MN, and then you have carbonate, which here is CO3, okay? So you split it like that, because one's a poly, this is a polyatomic ion, so one-to-one -one ratio. There are two different ions that it breaks into. So I need to take two of these, 4.2 times 10 to the negative six, and square it. This is x and x, so x squared. And so my KSP is just simply this squared, and it happens to be, I believe it was b. Okay. Uh, moving on to this one, MgF2. <clears throat> this is, again, whenever you're looking at the slightly soluble compounds, 
MGF2 is your solid, and it will break into Mg2 plus plus 2F minus. Okay? When you're writing this, this is a solid. I don't include it. So my equation, so it's products of a reactant. So this is going to be my reactant side. There is no reactant, so I can cross that out. It's one of these two here. There's a two here, so I need to include for that two. So the answer is E. Okay, someone said question 50. Um, your half-life is two years. It's been 10 years. So you've gone through five half-lives, okay? And we know the sample is 2.50. To make things easier, if I divide this by two, that means one half-life. If I divide it by two again, it means another half-life. Divided by two again, it means another half-life. So to make things easier, this is two to the fifth power. So 2.5 divided by two to the fifth power. Before we even try to solve it, if you started with a sample of 2.5 grams, <clears throat> it says what will remain after 10 years? It cannot be this. The reason why it cannot be this is because this is more than what you started. So if it was this, you've made matter from scratch, which would be impossible. So 2.5 divided by 2 to the fifth power, uh, the answer came out to this one right here. Okay, no one had a question about 51. Uh, 52, highest entropy, 25 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> the answer is gases. Entropy means disorder. Gases are hard to contain. They go everywhere. They fill up space. They travel everywhere. If you were to release the same amount of each of these into an area, you would not be able to contain CO2. It would just be gone. It would just be up in the environment, spread out. Everything else, you can still contain it inside of a container, inside a certain amount of space. Okay. Uh, take a look at questions 53 to 56. Okay, I see someone typed in 51. Uh, second law of thermodynamics, entropy of the universe is increasing. That's just something you have to memorize. Okay, question 53 to 56. And uh, preferably, if you're going to type for one of these, type it as early as possible so I can go through them in order. Okay. Okay, anything for 53 to 56? I see one answer, one question so far. <clears throat> okay, so if it's just on 54, okay, and 55. Uh, remember, your delta S is this value right here. This is equal to the sum of your products minus the sum of your reactants. So we want to make sure we include all of these numbers here. Uh, so I have six times HCl, which happens to be 186.8. And this is added to two times the B, which happens to be 5.9. And this is subtracted by the two times my unknown plus three times my H2, which happens to be 130.2. And all of this is equal to 161 that we mentioned. So I'm just algebraically solving for X at this point. And you should have gotten the answer, this one right here. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> All right. Now for question 55, uh, exothermic process, so it means that heat is leaving, okay? So your system is losing heat. So we know that delta uh, Q, F, Q system is going to be negative because we have lost heat. With that said, I can cross this out. I can cross this out. I can cross this out. When heat leaves, it goes into the surrounding. So when the heat of the surrounding increases, what does that say about my overall uh, entropy? So the entropy of the surrounding should increase. So the answer is B. Okay. 
All right, take a minute, look at questions 57 to 59. And let me know if there's something that you wanna go over there. Okay, so looking at this, uh, I guess the only question is 58. So first, um, this should be our equivalence point right at this stop. okay? Okay, I guess we're going through all of them. All right, so 57, decrease in uh, entropy. Inert gas means the reaction is not interacting. So it's not changing anything in there, okay? <clears throat> Uh, since we're dealing with entropy, um, we want to go ahead and find a way of restricting the movement. Adding more inner gas is not going to do anything. No reaction. Although it might cause more entropy because there's more stuff floating around. Uh, temperature is increase in temperature is not going to decrease our entropy. Decrease in the pressure means that we're squeezing it. It means it's moving around more. Uh, but it also means increasing the volume. So things get to move around more. Okay. Increasing the molar mass means, oh, you actually can't increase the molar mass. Uh, I don't know why that's in there. The only one that fits is decreasing the volume. Limit the space so it's more contained, it's more ordered. <clears throat> okay, uh, question 58. This is my equivalence point, okay? I see here 50 milliliters of my weak acid, 100 or 0.1 molar solution of my NaOH. So in order to hit equivalence point, 50 milliliters of my base should equal for 50 milliliters of my acid. So this is 0 0.1 molarity and 0 0.1 molarity. It makes it easier in that sense. So this is exactly where it is. And we can see it at 50 milliliters, it has a pH somewhere in that range, okay? Uh, it is above seven, so it fits that scenario. It says, what is a pKa? Remember, henderson hasselbalch equation is pH is equal to pKa plus log of your base over your acid. Remember, this base is not the base that's here. This is not that one. This is your conjugate base. So in order to get these two to be equal to each other, I want log to equal one, which means that I want the base, the conjugate base, equal to the weak acid. A place that that happens is known as the half equivalence point. Now, to get the half equivalence point, if I know the equivalence point, this is the volume at equivalence point, half of that amount is at 25. So I find out where 25 is. It looks like it's sitting close to six. So my answer is going to be six. Any questions? Okay. So in this scenario, spontaneous in all temperatures, let's plug in our equation. <clears throat> I definitely want this to be negative and I want this to be subtracted by a positive. So no matter what temperature I have, it is always gonna be spontaneous. So delta S of my reaction should be positive. So that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, okay? And delta H of my reaction should be negative. So it is A. Okay, go ahead and take a look at questions 60 to 63.
Okay, so uh, question 60. You have to find delta G, right? So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. We know the temperature um, says 290 Kelvin. So I have this piece right here. I need to find this and this. So look at the equation here. It, you put the entire equation, same format that we did before. This is all the values of delta S. This is all the values of delta H. So you do the sum of your products minus the sum of your reactants. So let me close the screen real quick to find it for delta H. I uh, look at these two right here. So it's 80.3 plus negative 212.5. And all of this is subtracted by two times zero happens to be zero. That's right here. And then add it to uh, SO2, which is negative 296.8. So this subtracted by that should give you your actual delta H value. Do the same for delta S, then you plug it in, find out which one is which. So it involves really like two or three equations. And I believe the answer came out to C. Okay. Uh, 61, this is you balancing the equation. So you're going to have to make sure that the equation is overall balanced. So you're trying to figure out what the um, coefficients are here. My recommendation, split them into their half reactions and do what you normally do with the half reaction method. We'll assume since you see H plus, it is an acidic step solution. So I have Cu and then I have Cu2 plus. And the other side I have NO3 minus and then O. And then I know that I'm adding in the water to balance this out, right? Because the number of nitrogens and number of carb, uh, copper is the same. I add the water, I add how many water, uh, this is, um, sorry, this is three, right? And this is one. So I need to add two waters at least to make sure that it has the right number of oxygens on both sides. Once I do that, this has four hydrogens, so I need to add four hydrogens to this side. And then at that point, you just keep balancing with the electrons. Um, and then you also need to make sure that both the electrons being transferred equals the electrons being gained. And I assume you know how to do that, so I'll skip past it, okay? <clears throat> okay um, someone asked about 62. Best way to look at this, if I look at CuO and I look at Cu, if it's a, just an atom by itself, the charge is zero. So CuO, the charge here should be plus two, and this is minus two. So it goes from plus two to zero. So the copper is actually being reduced. So I can cross this out, cross this out. Uh, I can cross that out. It's nothing to do with what I mentioned, right? So copper is being reduced, that much is true. So if copper is being reduced, what is it acting as? If it is undergoing reduction, what is it acting as? The oxidizing agent. So the answer is A. Okay. Okay, with that said, uh, go ahead and take a look at questions 64 to 68. <clears throat> Anything there you want me to go over? Okay, anything else? Okay, so for this one right here, <clears throat> there is a possibility, but it is very rare. For the ACS, it's very rare. For our previous finals, we usually just ask if that, if that formula makes sense. Uh, for E cell, the following reaction, it's always positive minus a negative, so 0 0.80 minus negative 1.66. So it's going to be added together. It comes with about 2.46 positive. OK? OK. Purpose of the salt bridge, a uh, couple of definitions. Simplest definition is allows electrolytes to flow from one cell in order to maintain electro neutrality. OK, so it completes the cell uh, and keeps it neutral. All right, and someone said, 
So again, for 68, you do not need to know this one for the amps and everything else. So you do not need to know that. You can look it up and learn it yourself, but for the purpose of electrochemistry that we've learned, you do not need to know this. Okay, 67, this is just the equation. E cell is equal to your cathode minus your anode. I don't care about any other combination, simple as that. Okay, with that said, let's move on to the last two questions. Uh, chances of 67 appearing as a question? Probably not. 68, no, it will not. I have never seen them mentioned before with amps. And if they do, what I would do personally is I would know that question and I'll handle that part. So don't worry about amps. If you wanna learn it on your own, you're welcome to learn it on your own then. Okay, anything from a 69 and a 70. We'll do both those questions together since there are just two questions, both of them, okay. So looking at this half reaction, SN is more positive, right? This is my cathode. Okay. <clears throat> With that said, this diagram is actually backwards. That means, remember, the electron is going to flow this way because you always go from the anode to the cathode. Says so this is more positive compared to that one. Fe is my anode. Okay. Once again, electricity flows from anode to cathode. And so when I want to draw my line notation, Good thing about the line notation is that in this diagram right here, the line notation anode is always on the left side, cathode is always on the right side. And since we said Fe is the one that is undergoing, is the anode that's undergoing oxidation, we want to make sure that Fe is on the left side. So I can cross this out, I can cross this out, I can cross this out. In fact, I can cross everything else. Fe is only on this side right here, Sn is on this side right here. And we know it's undergoing oxidation, so remember. You start with a charge of zero, you end up with a charge that's positive. So it goes from zero to positive, that's oxidation. And on the other side, tin here is undergoing reduction. So it goes from two plus to zero. So you can see the, it kind of like tell you this is what's happening in this direction. Okay, and on to the very last one here. <clears throat> uh, also very straightforward. You're trying to figure out what the voltage measurement is. Uh, you know that it is 0 0.8 minus 0. Oh, negative 0 0.76. So it should be giving you a positive value. We can cross out anything that is negative because we're assuming that this is something that generates a voltage, so it is going to be positive. Okay, any questions before we continue? No questions? Okay. Uh, let me switch back to the other PowerPoint real quick. <clears throat> uh, anything about grading? Anything about the final exam? Nothing? Okay. Uh, I just have one other thing I want to request. Um, so, even though I will see you in person for the final exam, right? Everyone's be wearing masks, you all be spaced out, too busy staring at your papers. So I would like to see some of your faces, even if it's just once. So if you're willing to, if you're in an okay place, yeah, right now, go ahead and turn on your camera. So I can put a name to a face. If you're willing to, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> um, average grade in the final exams, it varies depending on each semester. Some people do great, some people don't do great. Uh, what I can tell you is the overall average of the class is always between 73 to 76. Okay, so I never had to curve. That was always been, that's always been the case. It always comes out to an average of 73 to 76. Okay, uh, also a reminder, Please fill out the evaluation for QC and for the department. Okay. Um, with that said, I have one last thing I want to bring up to you. 
I have been in your WhatsApp group and in your Discord group since day one. So uh, I had fun observing what you guys are asking each other, uh, especially that question is, do we have recitation? Or do we have lecture? Okay. Uh, last thing I want to say, we are meeting in person uh, for the final exam. Uh, make sure you stay safe. Uh, make sure you follow all the protocols necessary and hopefully no one gets sick. Okay. And that's all we have for today. And the final exam is on the 21st. Yes, it is on the 21st, not the 14th. Okay. So don't come in on the 14th. You'll be there by yourself. Uh, which room? I think it was Remsen 101. I'll send a follow-up email to remind you what room and things like that. Okay. All right. Uh, enjoy your day. I will see you all in two weeks. See you in two weeks, Professor. Okay. Thank you so much. No Bye. Have a great day or night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night, Professor. You too. Uh, yes, there will be 70 questions. Uh, we can talk about that during your uh, during office hours right after this. So if you're interested in doing that, we can talk about it there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end the session and restart it and we can go over it. Okay. Uh, I am ending the session now in case anyone else has any other questions. Otherwise, I'm starting office hours right after.